Hey kids, welcome back to another video on the channel. Greatly appreciate you guys coming back. I'm sorry I start every video the same way and I wanted to break this one up a little bit. But today we're taking a look at a pretty cool firearm. You saw it in a previous video and as you can see it is currently locked up in my blacksmith gun safe. You've probably already seen the video on that as well. Let me know in the comments if you ordered one. But this is a pretty cool safe but it is actually holding what we are going to talk about today. So let's go ahead and Kentucky ballistic it, you know, put a thumb in it, and take out the firearm that is on the table for discussion today, or couch. As you can see, it is clear, and we'll close that up and leave that in the background. They sent it to me. Might as well plug them a little bit. Check it out. Link's in the description. But this is not a Browning high power. This is a Argentinian high power manufactured under license, and we'll be getting back to that. This one came from actually a good friend of mine, Ryan, uh, excuse me, Jakey, pardon me. I have a lot of good friends and I forget their names sometimes. Also, it's one o'clock in the morning. Thumbs up for being tired. But this is a high power clone that was manufactured under license from actual FN. Now, back in the day, FM, Argentinian uh, military, liked the FN so much they decided to build it. Well, they did it the right way, kind of like Canik does with Walter now, and they got a license and actually FN sent their inspectors down to make sure the processes were correct for the FM high power, which is also why it's one of the few that you will see that actually say high power right on the slide. The Gerson MCP35 is a clone of the high power, and it says MCP 35 because the Browning high power was introduced in 1935. Unfortunately, John Moses Browning had already passed by that point. One of his most famous designs, one of, leave it in the comments, I know you're going to, but one of his most famous designs was the Model 1911, created with Colt for the U.S. military trials, it eventually won and was in service, I believe, until 1982, 1983 with the main military. And, of course, Special Forces and many other people used it. Sorry, I have a bunch of aftermarket parts in here from Wilson Combat, and uh, it looked like my extractor was coming out. But it's not. It's not. It's just what Wilson did. Sorry. Go watch the video on it if you haven't. But the model of 1911 was created with a lot of rules in place. The U.S. military wanted manual safeties. They wanted a grip safety in, accordance, in addition to the grip safety module pod. Blah, blah, blah. Let's use English. In addition to the manual safety. So you had the grip safety and an external manual safety. Well, John Moses Browning decided when he got to design his gun that he did not want a grip safety on it. It still has a manual safety, but no grip safety. Additionally, this gun is a single stack 45 ACP, whereas this gun was always designed to be a 9mm. Daniel's Belgian that I use for a lot of my comparisons is a little bit tighter fit than this guy, but I'm hoping this is a good shooter. But the 1911, again, being a much bigger round, had much smaller capacity. 7 plus 1 when it first came out versus the high power, which had a 13 plus 1 capacity. And eventually that moved up in modern magazine technology, modern springs, as well as production. Means a lot of the high power clones can hold anywhere from 13 to 17 rounds if you add a little bit of a base plate to them. Otherwise, you can see there are lots of similarities between these two guns. One additional thing is this being a high power clone or licensed build, it does not 100% imitate it as it has a 1911 style cut like my Springfield has, although this is truncated because of the front serrations, instead of the standard browning, which is more of a CZ75 kind of like drop in here and then it flattens out, this is a little bit longer. This is a bushingless system, does not have a front bushing like a 1911 does. But other than that, very similar. They feel very similar in the hand. You can see that the front strap has a very similar angle. The back strap, this is more like an A1 with the humped main rear spring housing. I prefer the flat ones for my personal guns. But yeah, 
Like I said, John Moses Browning died before this gun came out. It was actually finished by uh, FN engineers, but John Moses Browning, being the prolific designer he was, was given the credit he deserved. This is a external extractor, which differs again from the 1911, but it does have same rudimentary sights. This one looks like it's been upgraded with excess big dots. Has a slide lock slide release that is a little bit longer, and you will notice another difference, and sorry if I keep comparing the two, is that this one has a plunger tube between the safety and the slide lock, which has a spring inside, which is the detent that allows these to work, whereas these use simple mechanical retention. The rear safety does the same thing. It blocks the trigger. And of course, when it is down, this gun does not have a grip safety nor a trigger mounted safety a la Glock. So if the safety is disengaged, this gun can fire. This is a very small vestigial safety on this. I would probably change out the grips in order to put a slightly larger safety on this. It does work fine though. A little bit of practice, you can get used to sweeping it on and off. Does have a commander style hammer. This is a hammer that was used on later versions of the Browning High Power. So this gun is probably, because they made this from 1960 to 1989, uh, this is probably an 80s model. It also has more of a target style slide lock slide release. The standard one, and I'll have to grab Daniels one of these days for a comparison, uh, is a much shorter version. This one is much longer, gives you better torque so you can drop the slide easier. Uh, we will show you, and you've seen me do it a couple of times, this has one glaring positive difference to the high power, and that is the fact that it does not have a magazine disconnect. So when this gun is cocked back, you can pull the trigger without the magazine in it. Why is that important? And I know some of you are going to pitch a tent over this, but if you are in a panic situation and you drop the mag out of a standard high power, number one, it won't come all the way out because of the mag disconnect. It'll probably do that because it's up against the trigger. But if you were to accidentally drop the mag in a panic situation, and we've all seen the videos on YouTubes of YouTubes on YouTube of officers in a panic situation dropping the mag out of their gun, and all of a sudden their gun could be dead. First generation uh, MP 45s had magazine disconnects, and some cops carried those in lieu of the Glock 21. So then all of a sudden you have a gun that's dead. If you have a gun without a magazine disconnect, even if you happen to drop the mag, you still have one round left. So you do have the ability to fire that last round. And one round could make the difference between, well, making a video saying, I got into a firefight, and somebody else making a video saying, Steve got into a firefight. So leave it down in the comments if you vehemently disagree with me. However, guns like the 1911, while having a grip safety, do not have magazine disconnects. This is my daily carry, so the mag that was in it was full of my hollow point ammo, so it is currently on my desk. But yeah, as you can see, oh, by the way, if you think I'm not prepared, though, hold on, there, there we go. This might be a range bag, but uh, yeah, uh, I always keep 1911 mags. Oh, look, that one's loaded. But I always keep extra 1911 mags in my, in my bags, because you never know when you're going to need them. Away with you. Mag tech. Decent ammo. Not paid by them, but I like their ammo. But yeah, no magazine disconnect could save your life. And I know I stuttered there. That happens from time to time. What do you say we go ahead and take this guy apart? Well, actually, let's talk about the trigger first. Sorry, these one takes can be all over the place. Since I just did a video on that, it's 1.30 in the morning. I need to go to bed, but I also need to make this video. Give me a like and subscribe if you like this late night shenanigans where I seem to be ADDing my ass off. But trigger. It is single action only, meaning once you pull the trigger, the trigger is dead unless the gun cycles. Once it cycles, it goes back into single action mode. That is very 1911-esque. However, it also means if you want to put the hammer down and carry with a round in the chamber and the hammer down for some reason, you have to manually drop it like that. Once you've done that, you do need to cock it in order to get it back into the fight. This big rounded hammer does make it easier to do, but it is um, 
not recommended to carry this gun that way. If you have fear of carrying a gun with one in the chamber that is hammer fired, I would recommend a gun like the Beretta, which can be started in double action mode or a number of SIGs, HKs, etc., because those guns are safer to carry. This one is designed just like the 1911 to be carried, cocked and locked. It is now safe. Drop that safety and you can fire it. The trigger pull on this guy is pretty decent. You can see there's some take up. This whole gun is rattly as heck though, but as you can hear, almost sounds like an airsoft, but yeah, sorry, I'm ADDing here. But as you can see, very little take up and then nice, nice trigger pull. That's another difference between the 1911 and this guy is that this has a trigger bar, whereas the 1911 is yoke around the mag straight back. Yeah, reset all the way out, really aren't hearing it, really aren't feeling it. Uh, a standard Browning like Daniel's Belgian is a much nicer shooting gun, except for the fact that it's a you know, very expensive gun. They're going in the $1,200 to $1,600 range, depending on the quality. These guys are still obtainable in the $400 to $600 range, so keep that in mind. I'm going to the range in the morning. I'll shoot some video because it sounds like my high point. Sorry about that. But yeah, the reset is not really audible, not really tactile. It just kind of all the way out and then go. But if you're a slapper like me, that works good. One thing I like about this particular gun is it does have front strap checkering in the actual design of the gun. Not 100% sure if that was always like that from the factory or if somebody else did that in time. Very possibly somebody else has done that to the gun, but I like it because it does give you some more grip. Whereas my 1911, this is my Springfield that was rebuilt by Wilson. That's right. Nearly a $3,000 gun has no front strap checker. You go over there. This is superior. I like the size of the trigger guard. Allows you to get a gloved finger in there if you happen to be like winter ops or something fun. What do you say we take it apart? Okay, go ahead and check it. Make sure there's nothing in it. And unlike a 1911, you're going to come all the way back to the secondary notch that you see right there. Lift up on the safety and you are going to wiggle your slide lock out. All you have to do is push up while moving it out. Wiggle it around a little bit and it comes free. Once you've done that, you can just pull back a little bit, drop your safety and voila, the gun comes apart. Now, this is very much a high power uh, pattern, so pay attention to which way the recoil spring is inserted into the slide. You will see the angle it sits at is very important because you cannot get it back together if you don't. Let's take a look at the frame first. Very, very basic, but it's actually pretty nicely finished considering it's a under license clone. I've seen a lot of cheaper ones. In fact, I had found for Daniel an Israeli contract high power, and it was extremely rough inside, needed to be completely redone. But this guy is really, really actually pretty damn decent. I put it on par with any of my normal 1911s. The Wilson obviously is a little bit better. Go ahead and take your spring and you're going to pull it out. Half length guide rod or it's just a bit of metal back here for attaching to the underside of the barrel. And it is a non-captive spring. Keep that in mind so that you don't send that flying. Comes out more like a Glock style pistol because there is no bushing up here. This is just a giant cup to hold the spring. Once you've done that, you can take your barrel out. As you can see, this uses Browning's tilting lockup system with locking lugs instead of the chamber lockup. As you can see in there, seeing again, it's been fired, of course. It's got a bunch of rounds through it, but it's in pretty good shape. You can see your extractors right there, so it's more internal. You still have a plate on the back here for your hammer and your firing pin, I mean. So you can always drop that down, take that off to take out your firing pin, but the extractor is right there. That's part of the rattlies. That roll pin right there holds all of that together. And no, we're not taking it apart. This gun should, in theory, work fine. And as long as it does, I will not be screwing with it. Once again, take a look at how you have this, because you will also see that the notch in the bottom of the barrel is off center. So you need to make sure that this is off center to match. 
Reassembly is exactly the opposite, so you just take it. Try not to launch this thing around your room. There you go. Insert it, and you will see you probably will have to adjust it a little bit as you reinstall the slide onto the frame. Just make sure it clears the bottom of the gun, bring it all the way back, lock it back using the safety, take your slide lock slide release. There is no swinging link for it to line up with. This is actually going through that uh, piece of the guide rod. So it actually holds the guide rod in place, wiggle it in, and as you can see, it goes in nice and loose, bring it down, and make sure the gun works. This gun needs to be oiled before it goes to the range, but I will be taking it to the range and seeing which one I prefer. Hint, hint, 1911. But this might be a nice shooter and something to add to the collection for fun skis. Yeah, so that's it. If you like this one, make sure to leave me a like, subscribe, all that good stuff down there. I've got grease on my fingers, so now it won't work. Let's try this one. Make sure to pick up one of these safes if you don't have one so that you can safely store your firearm, the blacksmith tube pistol safe from Banggood. And there you go. So come back for another video. I'm Joe. This is the Jiminy Show. And I'll talk to you later.